gathering experiences from people around the globe to create and share knowledge. This is Pioneer Knowledge Services. Hello, I'm Edwin K. Morris. I serve as the president and founder of Pioneer Knowledge Services. Welcome to Knowledge Management Television. This is an educational service provided by Pioneer Knowledge Services and the podcast series Because You Need to Know. KMTV is your video resource to a valuable collection of conversations with knowledge management and nonprofit champions from around the planet. Enjoy. Hello, everybody, and I'm, I'm actually pleased to be here. And it's our first, and our first guest uh, is Paul Corney, um, who's uh, currently the uh, SIDIP president. And um, he's widely known in the industry uh, as being a knowledge management leader and advocate. And he's uh, known worldwide. He's uh, been heavily involved in developing and rolling out some of the key standards and ISO accreditation to really help further um, our knowledge management practice and our profession and really help to legitimize it. And I think that's um, something that we, um, we're all kind to um, advocate at the moment and trying to move forward with. Paul, have I missed anything out? Um, hopefully not, but that Italy, I, I'm sure it will emerge as we delve into uh, this topic that often causes a number of uh, people to get quite agitated. So it should be quite fun. Agitated? It gets people agitated? Paul, come on. Edwin, you never looked at the chat lines. <laughs> there, 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 there's a number of people who've always felt that uh, the idea of standards was was something that you couldn't do, and lots of people believe you can't you can't manage knowledge. So um, historically, I, if you if you want me to go back over sort of where I came from on this journey. Um, when I was when I was growing up, which is more years ago than I care to remember, to, to remember, um, one of the challenges I, I faced back in the mid mid nineties, I think it was, um, was I was setting out on a KM journey at the time, and it was hugely difficult then in about ninety four, ninety three, ninety four, to describe to people uh, what exactly this thing was because it was about information management as most as far as most people were concerned. Mm -hmm. It was about libraries. It was about a whole range of different things. Um, and it was a huge challenge for people to get it. Uh, so well, fast forward 25, 26 years, what's changed? Mm -hmm. but, but, I, but I think the, the, the thing that really struck, stuck with me all the time was this idea of, of corporate legitimacy. You know, mm -hmm. it, 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 within an organization, if you look at an organogram, there were certain functions and I and I had the pleasure of you know working lots of different industries as advisor and and so but but there were certain functions that were always there like uh, personnel became HR which became talent management and it, and it had a body of people and it had an association and it had accreditation that were widely accepted so it was generic you could almost go anywhere you know and, and knowledge management sort of never had anything like that so, Monica, do you think it's because do you yeah, think it's, it's too it's too wide? Do you think it's because our practice is so wide? Um, uh, yeah, and but touches it, well, on all of the things you've just mentioned, which is HR. You know, we do. Of, of course, it does. We do do uh, probably training. We do the IT side of it. Is it because it's so broad that it's, that that it's been quite difficult to actually pin it into one area or find that home for it? Do you think that's what it, that's what the difficulty has been? Well, I, I think human beings. What, what's the first thing we do? You know, you, I often give people when I'm running a masterclass or running an event, I ask them to sort of give their elevator pitch of what they think knowledge management is. If you were sitting down, I always say you were sitting down to dinner with your prospective mother-in-law or father-in-law and they say, what do you do? And you're in knowledge management, what would you tell them? Mm -hmm. You know, which is a huge challenge. Now, in, in the past, if you go back to all those other horizontal disciplines, let's call it a horizontal discipline, if you look at the other horizontal disciplines in any organization, um, again, you've got personnel, right? So you've got CIPD, you've got marketing, you've got the Chartered Marketing Institute. Mm -hmm. You know, across, across the spectrum, you've got different disciplines. Um, they're all horizontal disciplines, but, but they have a home and they have an in, a body 
and they have some kind of accreditation which they can aspire towards. So if they leave an organization, they can go and work somewhere else. Mm. And they can go and work in marketing or they can go and work in communications, internal or external. So as human beings, we we love labels. And part of the problem is what do you call what do you what label do you put on this? Well, don't 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 you think the organizational structures in your comparison, right, to HR or the CFO or budgets or or any of those other horizontal layers to the cake of an organization, the and I I hear I hear what you're saying that the adoption has been slow in an organized way. We've never really knowledge management hasn't really represented itself real well to the rest of the world. The ISO gives us a, a flag on the play to say, here we are, this is what we're gonna center ourselves on. Does the rest of that follow? If we're gonna follow suit like HR, think of how many undergraduate courses there are in HR. Or, yeah. Yeah. right, I mean, we're, we're just not represented anywhere in no, the formal like academics. Well, no, let me, let me tell you, uh, you know, the other thing, uh, I, I've had the, uh, Back in I, ten years ago, I was teaching on an MSc in knowledge and information management, and it was dying because and it died. And I ended up sitting on the board that actually killed it, which was a long story and it was quite bizarre. But but at the time, it was it was partly because there was no career path; they right. weren't going anywhere. So you right. churn you churned out a graduate with this. And it was a bit like, and I, I'm going to get shot for this. It was a bit like a, a an MSc in media studies, you know. Yeah. Right. I so, actually have. Uh, I actually do have one of the masters. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, and uh, no, I, but is, is this is this what made you think about the first step being actually we need to get that accreditation and we get to need to get not just recognised academically but also legitimised corporately. Yeah, um, I, I, I mean, I, I, it's. It was fascinating. I, I've had, for the majority of my life, I've worked internationally. Um, and for, for the first 20 years, while I was an investment banker, my patch was uh, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, predominantly Middle East. So I saw at close hand from about 70, about 90, 78 to 98, I saw at close hand how the Middle East in particular picked up standards of sorts and services and accreditation and if you look at countries that have made huge progress like Dubai and the UAE part of it's been based upon some kind of sort of accreditation structure and standard structure which people are measured against mm -hmm. um, and it was and as I carried on going around the world it, it really struck me that again you you need some kind of home and knowledge management had so many parts of the uh, people who were holding the flag, going back to, to Edwin's point, people were sort of trumpeting their own ways of doing things and their own systems and their own processes. And, and if, I, if I see another quadrangle, you know, four segment <laughs> representation, <laughs> I'll go mad. It, yeah. It's not about that for me. It's about, it, it may be called a different thing in different parts of the organization, but I, wrote, I gave a speech back in, I think, five years ago at, um, at believe it or not, a Sillips annual conference in Brighton. And I used the phrase that the, I think the, um, the idea of a KM chartership and the ISO standards were pathways or down the road towards corporate legitimacy of knowledge management. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and to Edwin's point, totally there's you know there's different people with different views on the standards and whether they are they are a valuable thing or not but for many parts of the world the idea of, of a an independent benchmark something you can go back and assess yourself against is hugely valuable absolutely yeah i think I, I found, yeah. yeah i found very interesting this point of view from you paul honestly having uh, an accreditation for knowledge management but I have also some concerns. So yeah. normally, normally it's very difficult from my experience, based on my experience, to find a poor KM job. So if being accredited as a KM professional is a good way to find a job, that's wonderful. 
But how about if this is not the right way? I mean, KMR is uh, always a shock to be appreciated from many organizations, especially, for example, in Italy or in South Europe, but it's not the only way. So it is not a way to, um, to reduce our possibilities to find a job where we can land and then we can disseminate our knowledge inside them and so our methodologies, you know? Yeah, I, 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 I mean, we are a niche uh, and I'm wondering if being accredited as KM professional can let us to be even more secure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, but wouldn't that mean that we'd actually have to? If 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 that was that would only be the the, the worst case scenario if mm -hmm. um, people didn't understand the standards and accreditations. That's true. That's it. so. It, it, are we trying to say that if that is rolled out, it has to be in parallel with um, uh, you know, building awareness and understanding within certain countries, you know, for example, Italy, Spain, you mm -hmm. know, and, 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 and Europe. Would, would, so it would, do we know if that's, if that's actually going to be the plan for rolling these standards out, that they actually have that, um, in that awareness in those countries? Mm -hmm. Paul? Cool. Um, question. Do I, do I know every country that, uh, that's adopted the standard? No. Um, but I do know that it was very well received. Normally, this the ISO process, having sat on the KM Standards Committee, the BSI one in the UK, which was very heavily involved in the drafting and, uh, and sort of submission of the standards, um, it, was, it had an incredibly strong response because ISO standards have to be submitted for approval by all the member states. And all the member, I think it has something like an 80% approval rating. Uh, so the standards, the standards were, uh, were sort of pushed through in a way that uh, suggested that, it, that there was uh, ad adherence and a, a, a satisfaction level was achieved. To mm -hmm. Janetta's point about does it make sense? Um, are you constricting people in the knowledge management profession. If you, it depends what you, whether you think of accreditation mm. as some kind of university discipline, possibly not. The way the, way the, the, the SILIP accreditation is working is it's a self-certification which is assessed. So it's about your portfolio. It's not you passing an exam which I think has got much more validity. So it is showing your general all-round experience. You have a mentor, you have somebody who is, you know, wise in this profession. And at the end of that, you're assessed as to whether you have the all-round capability and you demonstrated um, your capability to the satisfaction of the people who award the certification. So it, it's it's more for me that's a better way of doing it rather than all sitting down passing an exam which doesn't necessarily mean anything i don't know Jeanette, yeah. does that answer your question i i agree i agree totally what you're saying uh paul because i think the tested methodology of proving proficiency is is not as clear as someone working like you say with a portfolio approach of what have you done what have you completed? You know, project-based, uh, performance-based, that's way more important than passing a test in my view. So I, I think this, I think the whole ISO procedures and not all industries care about standards. You know, no. it's not, it, it's not like it's going to change everything, but it is the first step in my view of a validation of who and what we do and are and what we're for that did not exist before. And the cool thing is with ISO is that knowledge management is also implanted in the HR ISO. So now we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're starting to feel out where we show up in these organizational structures. Well, it, it actually, Edwin, yeah. to your point, it actually, it actually is part of the, the umbrella group it sits under, it sits above it, is actually HR. So the so the, the KM standard fits, sits within that. I think it's ISO uh, Working Party two hundred and sixty something like that. But but I let me let me just tell you a little, little bit of story where which when I realised the value of this, I was um, I was had the great pleasure of working on an assignment for 
three and a half years with um, the largest company in Iran. And um, it was after the new president was elected in 2013, August 2013. And one of the drivers for that, believe it or not, this company uh, has something like 35 operating units, 30,000 people, you know, massive conglomerate. And one of its big divisions was, um, was locomotion. So it produced the most amazing engines, which in the end, uh, Siemens were licensing some of their technology before um, we had the uh, episode of the sanctions again. But at the time, I think it was the Iris standard. Iris is the standard for locomotive manufacturers, which none of us would necessarily mm -hmm. have anything about. But I think Article 40 of that um, said you had to produce evidence of, of effective knowledge management. And, and so there you are, right? So if you were producing, even producing a locomotive, a locomotive if you couldn't evidence that, mm -hmm. and then you couldn't get the kite mark for locomotion. And, and it's the same issue. Um, you know, why do people do ISO? Well, partly going back to the quality thing, because your clients demand it. Now, I if you, you go on. So I was going to say, one, one, it just struck me that you're talking about industries, and I'm thinking one of the, the industries I think would benefit from something like that is the NHS or the, you know, the healthcare industry at the moment, and it being um, something that um, needs to be more evidence-based. And I think that's a, 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 something that we've learned from, obviously, um, other organisations and other industries. Um, and I think that's something that potentially we could use to move us even further forward um, on an international scale. As well, well so I, that accreditation becomes more. I, I, I guess. I mean, it, it's very difficult, isn't it? I, I can recall having lunch one day. I got invited into lunch with the finance director of HSBC <laughs> in the city. You're a I, lucky man, Paul. Well, it was. Just, <laughs> I happened to be passing. <laughs> I happened to be passing. But 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 the the guy who, who the guy who was the the guy who was a good friend was the chief knowledge officer. He's now based in Hong Kong. And he was, um, he said, look, come in and meet, and meet the, the chap. And we, we sat down, we we're having lunch. And I always remember the conversation. It was fascinating. He was, it, you know, if it wasn't, if there was no kind of evidence, it was, it was evidence-based. And it's that challenge about evidence-based. And I, and I could tell every story under the sun about stuff that I'd done, about the difference it made. Here's a great yeah. example. But, but you need that combination of some form of substantiation, which a standard and or accreditation gives you, uh, which I think is quite important. He, if I could have said to him at the time, OK, well, here is something that's independent. And here's a sort of roadmap, and the way that we do this maps directly back. Then, then it would have been more persuasive to him than me talking about, uh, you know, the fact that somebody being able to learn a lesson meant that we did something better, or that Airbus built the A350 aeroplane as a result of a peer assist, a giant peer assist they did on the 380. So the A350 entered service as the most efficient airline in history because of the peer assist and all the work the knowledge management team facilitated on as a result of learning from the A380. When these use cases are, are, are fabulous to have, isn't it? Mm. I mean, this is, where, do we, where can we find somewhere where these use cases you know, exist? I mean, where, where's a natural <laughs> home for someone like myself to go and find well, out yeah, where... So, Monica, this is going to be a shameless plug, but if you read if you read the two <laughs> books, if you read Navigating the Minefield, Right, which was the first book I co-authored with uh, Patricia. Uh -huh. uh, it, the, the Airbus story is in there, as is the U.S. Army, as is lots of others, and and I'm sure you've read the KM Cookbook, and I have, you know, and that maps directly to to the ISO standard. And the uh -huh. reason, the reason, the three of us, Chris Collis and being the other one, the reason we wrote it like we did was to make sure that people were able to bring to life something that was. It's a very dry subject. I mean, it's 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 great for insomniacs. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so you know, it's not. It, it, so you need something that's a little bit more light-hearted. That, but actually, our view was we can map the ISO standard uh, to many of the w world's exemplar organisations and and map their KM activity to that. And then we created the KM Canvas as a way of discussing and looking at um, how somebody's KM program works. 
So I've got to ask, Paul, seeing as you've got such a global footprint and experience, is there a certain region and or culture that adopts KM better? No. <laughs> uh, that's a good, a good answer. I, I, I think it, KM it, it, is special and it, 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 it changes from a culture to another, from an organization to another organization. So it's a pretty difficult, no? I, I couldn't agree more, Junetta. No, here's a story, right? I, I, was, um, I was chairing a conference in Hong, in Hong Kong um, five, six years ago. And it was really interesting at the time, we were trying to get people to engage with, with the sort of the audience. And I discovered that the only way that you could get people, there, there's, there's very much a thing in Asia about deference to your elders and not wanting to be speaking in public and, and, and to be, you know, to be only speak when asked. And I found when you, when you gave permi people permission to do something in the form of a game, it changed the way people behaved. So I, um, at the end of any event, I would ask someone a question. I'd, I'd pre sort of plant them in the audience, go and then say, look, I'd walk around with the microphone, ask them a question and say, look, what do you think about that? Um, and they'd come out like so and so. I'd say, okay, choose somebody else. So the point was it was from within <laughs> them. They would then go and hand the microphone to somebody. Mm -hmm. And that became wow. much more of a collaborative thing, but it was playing to the culture. To, to, so that's to your point, Janetta. It very much depends on the culture. I'll give you another Iranian story, right? At the time, they came up with a code of ethics, the organization I was working with. Translating from Farsi back to English was not good. We were about to run a series of after action reviews on some massive projects that they'd been doing. And one of the articles in the um, code, of, code of Ethics was, subordinates must be given the right to recompense the company in the event of any mistakes. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> no. yeah. And, that's tough. And, right. Yeah, yeah and, that's, that's heavy stuff. This is, this is stopping people from, from speaking out, from sharing knowledge. This is actually goes against the whole of our principles, right? Well, it's... It, it, <sighs> It goes against what we in the West think our principles uh -huh. are, but but that's mm -hmm. the whole point. It depends where you are in the world. Okay, I'm happy. I'm lucky enough to live in in Lisbon as well, and you know another Southern European uh, country. There are things that you do and don't do, and things you say and don't say. You know, and and silence is is actually often a weapon as well as a way of expressing a response. But but in a Western culture, we tend to want to fill the vacuum all the time. That's so, true. So the culture thing is, what I found to, to, to Janetta's point is that very often, and, and I've used it extensively throughout my career, is is narrative and story is one of the best ways of bringing knowledge management to life, but also of getting people to talk. <laughs> you tell a story and then and you express it in a different way. We had a, um, the company I was managing partner of, uh, back in, I think, end of 2008, 2009, we, we went and did a big piece of work with the Asian Development Bank in Manila, which was around the use of narrative and story to underpin a lot of their KM practices. And it was quite interesting because on the staff was the former head of CNN Asia, I think at the time, who was... Um, was driven by a journalistic approach to narrative and stories, whereas um, in, a, in a knowledge management uh, way, it, you very often have to let the, 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 the sort of the examples emerge. Um, and we, the other, I'll give you another example, right, um, from the Caribbean. Uh, we were, I did a piece of work, leading a piece of work for the Central Bank of the Caribbean the Caribbean Development Bank, which is like the World Bank for the Caribbean. And one of the uh, really interesting examples was around uh, the whole idea of evaluation. And the way that uh, most development institutions, Janetta, you'll know this, uh, most development institutions focus on figures and numbers, don't they? So when you, when, when you do... When, yeah, when you do any, any evaluation, you say, I've done this project. And I always remember this school project 
there was, I won't say the country because it would embarrass them, but there was a, a project, a schools project, and it got all the ticks. It was done on time. It was gleaming new. Uh, they didn't overspend, you know, blah, blah, blah. And when you ask the basic question, well, how many people go there? Um, well, actually, it was still gleaming new because very few people go there because they couldn't afford to go there because they couldn't afford, there was no bus service. And so the, the evaluation was perfect, right? The project was perfect, but it missed, the, it missed the whole point, which was about the story. Had they have told the story of the, of the school through the lives of people who were, were or weren't going there, they'd have got a different, different perspective. So I, I've always believed you have to manage both principles and in a way going back to what i was saying about the cookbook that was how our uh, whole narrative around that was to bring a dry subject to life sorry mm -hmm. i've spent more than 15 minutes but i hope that helps it's That's super right. interesting to be honest yes <laughs> yeah. absolutely well in order to to put a end end on this whole program i think we ought to just go around the the hosts here and if you've got a burning question let's ask it uh monica and then janetta my question will be about the KM Charter, because I think we've spoken about quite a lot of um, evaluations and standards and accreditation, and we spoke about the Charter, um, I, you know, we touched on it. And it, kind of having a, you know, seen what you've just been speaking about, um, is, this, is the KM Charter something that's going to evolve? Um, because you mentioned that um, it isn't just going to be, you know, passing a test. It's, it's going to be a portfolio of things. Is it going to be something that actually changes as our industry changes and adapts with it? Well, yeah. Well, I, actually, Paul, if you could just describe what the KM Charter yeah. is to begin with and then answer the question, please. Um, yeah, it, 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 the KM Chartership is a, you, you are asked to present a portfolio of your work, a series of reflection journals, um, and then they will be evaluated by uh, a body, right, who, who do already do that within SILIP, um, and you're then de designated as whether you have qualified for chartership or not. So, and, and I think the answer to that, because it's not saying you have to evidence, you, there are things you have to evidence that you've done, and you have to of, and it might be something like, so for example, Monica, you might have um, helped to transform an organization and set up communities which have resulted in dramatic improvements in the way an organization works. That would be slightly different, say, maybe from Janetta, who did uh, an incredible thing, bringing lessons back into an organization that helped the next project to move forward. Th those things will evolve naturally because of the state of, of what we're doing. Um, and, and the second thing is, of course, you could then there's fellowship. I mean, there's a number of prominent names in the industry who are actually working through their fellowship at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so, so and, and you will continue to be assessed as you move forward. So you can be reassessed to keep, to keep your, um, your practice current. I, I think just to pick that up, what I've taken most comfort from if you look at, you mentioned health earlier on, look at the work that was done by um, Sue Lacey Bryant and the people uh, in Health Education England, um, their knowledge and library services now use something called the Professional Knowledge Skills Base, PKSB, um, as their backdrop for the way that their knowledge and library professionals move forward. Um, and so that is one of their foundations and people are working towards chartership within the organization. It's part of their step on, on moving forward. Brilliant. I mean, and, and this goes to your point of, of people actually, um, and, and, and Janetta's point right at the beginning of, of, of our chat, which looked at, is this accreditation going to stop people from you know, becoming more niche or is it going to be more open? And I think, you know, having an example like the uh, you know work that Sue's doing, it's obviously something that's become more progressive, and I yeah. open more doors. I, I've been I've been lucky. I mean, in my role of president, one of the things I've set up is I call it in conversation with. So every Thursday, I reach out to somebody who can be anywhere, somebody in St Andrews, Copenhagen, anywhere. All right, um, who's a member, and I have a half an hour conversation with them. And I give them the same sort of questions. I ask them about surprises. What's a day in the life look like? 
and, and I've heard the most amazing stories. Last week, I spoke to a lady who um, is leading the uh, charge here on looking at the impact of uh, long COVID. Mm. And, and her, um, her research, and I've just put her in touch with uh, a, psy a psychologist and psychiatrist who's actually coming out the other side, who's, who's, who's a performance um, psychologist, who's actually helped athletes and others get over the effects of long COVID. Um, and, and they're trying to build those back into their uh, learning models for treating the, the, the impact of it. So that, that's where knowledge management, for me, has a massive opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. The well, point Jan is... Janetta, uh, yeah. go ahead with your question. Thank you. I think, Paul, you just answered my burning question, but if you had only 60 seconds of your time to describe or to answer to this question, I am a CAM professional, for example, and I ask you, I have just a few funds to spend on accreditation, and I'm comparing being accredited with a chartering or like or with Prince too, for example. So why should I choose your program, your SILIP program, your SILIP accreditation and not Prince too? Because Prince too works perfectly okay if you are in a project, mm -hmm. right? If you're managing a project, uh, chartership is a much broader spectrum for me. It's not, it's not you know, it, it, it's, one is horizontal, one is vertical, right? If you like, right. so so Prince to me is a vertical response to uh, to a, sure. and it's perfectly valid and it's great if you're in project management, but knowledge managers. And the great thing for me has always been about knowledge managers or whatever you're called. You know that the the questions that people ask haven't changed since the mid nineties. They're the same questions. You know, it's how can you do better at what you do? How can you win more business? How how can you learn? The, the two words I hate more than any other are lessons learned when they're uttered by politicians, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because it's an excuse to kick something into the long grass and do nothing about it. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the problem we have at the moment is, and, and go back to COVID, right? If you look at, there was a, a study done, and, and Monica knows this, I, I helped set up and was part of our, our city's COBRA committee. We have a COBRA committee. Mm -hmm. And one of the pr first presentations I gave to them, which was our MP and the leaders of the council, the civic leaders, the health sector, police, one of them first one was to look back and say, in nine, I think it was in 2016, uh, the cabinet office ran a, pro a project called Cygnus, which was looking at the potential impact of a pandemic. Right, mm -hmm. and you look at go back and look at Operation Cygnus. Um, okay. It was the Lincolnshire Resilience Forum, I think, amongst others, and and a lot of the recommendations were made in there, but were never actioned. Mm -hmm. We never spent the money on it, you know. Mm -hmm. So the and and my final thought on that, and I'll I'll go back to a, a good friend of mine. Um, uh, was a guy called Professor Victor Newman, who some of you may know. When he took over, I think it was the chief learning officer of Pfizer. Um, I think it's a story he always tells. Uh, he, he had a he went off to um, a country in the Far East, who I won't name, to uh, to a, an exercise, a lessons learned exercise, and I think they came up with two hundred and seventeen lessons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, he, and he quite started, a lot. <laughs> well, exactly. And and his comment was, "I'll have three, you know, basically." Yeah. Because the problem is, unless you actually feed, and this is where knowledge management's fun, unless you feed what you do back into process mm -mm. and you improve the process, it doesn't go anywhere. It's knowledge in action, isn't it? Yeah. It, it, to me, it's, it's, and that's one of the critical things. And that's where there is a danger with knowledge management, that it's, uh, you know, it, this whole idea of, yes, we've done a lesson learned exercise. Well, uh, they're lessons identified, not lessons learned. Right, right. My experience is similar to that in the lessons learned realm, uh, working with the Intel Center at the U.S. Army, that you have to integrate 
to learn. So if you don't integrate, that's the final step, right? Reintegrate mm. and and and, mm. and adopt, uh, make action come out of that learned lesson. But uh, my final question to you is this. So are you uh, a proponent of knowledge management academics being in a business school or library sciences school? <laughs> I know, I mean, right? I, I, you know, <laughs> I, I could almost say something. I, do you know this is going to sound awfully flippant? I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> and, 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 and partly the reason I don't care to that example. And l let me give you another thing. There, there is, there's, an, there's something going on at the moment. There's a bit of excitement about where, where, do, you house, um, mm. where do you house learning? Where do you house teaching? You know, I, I remember having long conversations with people because I, I, I've taught, I've been on the, the faculty of a couple of universities and I teach sometimes still when post-COVID, pre-COVID at the International Islamic School in uh, University in Kuala Lumpur. And it, it's always struck me as one of the problems is, do you, are you producing knowledge from an acad from academia, which can then be applied. So, is that pure knowledge that is then applied for the benefit of man, or do you produce curricula that allows people to f sort of pursue careers? Because one of the challenges that organisations always tell me is that people they need so much time of people coming out of university to to make them sort of effective within the organisation. So that's, that's why I, I, I answer don't care, Edwin, to that extent, because I think it depends on where you sit on that spectrum. Do you believe it's better to produce pure knowledge out of a knowledge and learning institution, or do you produce people who have applicable knowledge that they can take into a profession? Well, don't you think every industry in academics that's represented just fosters more PhDs ultimately? I mean, the academic institution is to make PhDs, right? To of to course. regenerate new knowledge and keep the keep the engine running around academic process and learning and discovery, right? So why not have knowledge management? In in my my humble oh. opinion, knowledge management should be at a hub of a business operation or business school versus library sciences because library sciences is a very small pocket of the big world and yeah. and and the relevancy in in my view the relevancy of library sciences is not what it was 50 years ago a lot of libraries have had to change and adapt with the times to become more relevant to find more customer service focused entertainment and infotainment but yeah, i mean we're getting gyms in our one soon yeah and and you will if you look at um there's a, if you look at, the, well, you, this is, a, again, a plug, right, 30th of June, put this in your diary. Um, <laughs> I'm, lunch, I'm putting it in right now, 30th <laughs> of June. Lunchtime on the 30th of June, uh, I'm going to be hosting the second presidential debate, right? Wow. Which will do. And in that, I've invited a lady called Kate Thompson, who is an award-winning author, uh, journalist for the Sunday Times, The Guardian, has written 10 books, and I think I've shared with you, Monica, with her permission, her Brilliant. manuscript. You've read it, yeah? Yeah, I'm reading it. Yeah, and, it, and it's about, and that will be published next year, but it is about um, Bethnal, 100 years of Bethnal Green Library, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, so it's tracing the evolution of that library from uh, its early days through to today uh, and how it survived the war. And it's being told through 100 librarians, who she's interviewed. Wow. Yeah. Through the eyes of the people. Through the happens. eyes and the lenses. And, and that's the stories. And, and, and Kate and I are going to be having a discussion much like this around that on the 30th. But there are other examples for like living libraries, which are uh, being produced at the moment. Um, last year, there were some really interesting uh, pieces that, uh, the, the pieces of work that were produced. Um, and, and they're moving forward. Silip are actually involved in some of them. And this idea of, of making libraries more than the dusty place where you've got books. You know, one of the, one of the, um, one of the wonderful stories that came out of uh, one of my in conversations with was, was the, with a young lady who's a library supervisor in the Isle of Wight. 
and she's just she's never actually hasn't that don't think she'd actually been to a new library she was sort of taking over there and one of the first things she did was to paint a mural between like the housing mm. association which were next to the library she painted a mural along so that it encouraged people and she said one of her statements was something like um, no one trains us to be social workers mm -hmm. wow. because actually they are today you know i they're, they're fulfilling a role which is which is like social workers mm -hmm. and and if you look at the kruger report which the prime minister commissioned um, which is now sitting with the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. One of the, um, one of the findings of that is that libraries should be like the collective hub of the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that means Absolutely. it has to have a much, mm -hmm. a much greater, a greater yep. role. Um, but it means that people have to upskill to your point, Edwin. Yes. Yeah. yeah there's, you know? there's a civic, there's a civic Im implication more so with that structure now, I think. And mm. it, it kind of goes back to the point of, so would knowledge management be best suited in a library sciences school or a business school? Well, yeah. honestly, if I can <laughs> say my <laughs> my point of view, I hope that any KM accreditation starting from CILIP uh, can help to have a semester or be an entire course in any type of university because we should start to push in KM with a younger generation. So I think it's not a matter or a question or of uh, is better having KM courses in business or in library because I think KM is also present in engineer or in Ooh. astrophysics or in mathematics. So if any accreditation or any other course or any ISO can help to, uh, to push KM in any type of university, starting from university, that would be already a success. My, my final thought to pick up on that, Janetta, is that the, that the whole point of the chartership is that it will recognize any career, any, any degree course or anything else exactly. that you've done because it feeds into it. Perfect. You know, that's, that's part of your, your portfolio. And it, it's just the same, I, you know, I won't, shame, won't name and shame people, but there's lots of different programs out of there. They should be part of it, be, albeit Henley, albeit the, yep. the, you know, KMI or others, all of who've got perfectly valid um, functional programs, but they should be recognized as part of it. But, but, but otherwise the difference is this is independent. It's by Royal Charter and it's not a profit making. Exactly. Mm. The, others have got, the others have got a skin in the game. You know, I, I stood up in Hong Kong. I was completely popular a couple of years ago when there were people sort of promoting all of the new uh, programs that were out there. And, and but, but they, the whole point was somebody was making money out of it. It was partly mm -hmm. a profitable thing. Silip doesn't have that. It's, it's by Royal Charter. So, you know, it's a charity. That's the whole point. Sorry. Well, I've gone no, that's a hey, big point. That, that's, that's a big point. It's a big strength. That's a, that's, that is a very big point because Pioneer Knowledge Services is that KM charity in the U.S. And mm. so I hear what you're saying. You're singing my tune, Paul. Paul, <laughs> to wrap things up, what's your definition of knowledge management? Um, how, how about how about something about helping people and organisations to make better decisions? I cannot disagree. I cannot agree more, honestly. <laughs> Paul, do you have a charter ship? Me? Well, no, I, I help set it up. <laughs> that, 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 that's poacher turn gamekeeper, isn't it? <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us today, Paul. It was a blast. All right. Thank good, you. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Subscribe and like this video for more content similar to this one. And if you have a topic that you think would be interesting to talk about, leave your recommendation in the comments.